Hello and welcome to the Unlock Your Life Purpose Summit. I am your host, Lorna Moon. And today's guest we have is Jamie Andrew. Jamie is a very unique mountaineer with an amazing story. And he's an incredible individual. And I would say more, but I am not going to steal his thunder. So let's just welcome Jamie. Hello, Thank Jamie. You, Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. And Jamie's coming to us all the way from Scotland. That's right. It's quite a lovely country in there. So Jamie, I didn't want to spoil any of your stories. So I'm going to let you just dive right in and tell us your story and how you came to find your purpose. Okay. Well, um, as you said, Lorna, I'm, I'm a mountaineer and I've been a mountaineer since I was uh, 16 years old is when I first took an interest in climbing mountains and from that point on it became my my passion you know it was it was, it was the what was your climbing. first mountain oh we you know like any any um mountaineer I started small and started working my way up so here in Scotland we have many fine hills rather than mountains <laughs> um and yeah started here and gradually worked my way up um, until I was climbing in, in the European Alps and occasionally over in America, um, mainly in, interested in, in shorter, harder climbing rather than big Himalayan mountains. Um, mm. That was not, not really my style, but, uh, shorter, harder technical climbing. Mm. Um, but you know that, that certainly did not make me stand out from the crowd at all. I was a very uh, good, but average, you know, mountaineer um, <laughs> and, but it was my passion in life. Mm -hmm. What did really change everything for me and, 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 and did ultimately make me really, as you said, unique, was an incident that happened in 1999. So 21 years ago. Um, myself and my very good friend and climbing partner, another Jamie, Jamie Fisher, were climbing in the French Alps uh, on a mountain called Les Droites, um, which is a 4,000 meter peak, the, mm -hmm. the big peak, uh, but, 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 but not massive, but it does have this incredible north face, a thousand meter wall uh, wow. on, on one side, a snow and ice and rock wall. And it's one of the great north faces of the Alps, it really is. And uh, we went to go and climb this in the winter of uh, 99. And, you know, we were well prepared for this kind of thing. We were well trained. We were um, strong and fit and climbing really well together as a partnership. So ordinarily, it would have been a relatively straightforward climb for us. Um, but it was during this climb, on the second day of the climb, actually, as we were approaching the very summit of the mountain, that, um, well, our luck took a turn for the worse. And mm. we were engulfed by a sudden unforecast and unexpected storm mm. so you know that's not ideal but once again we you know we were prepared for that kind of eventuality you know storms are not uncommon on mountains so we were, <laughs> we were well prepared for it um and but we were at the most most vulnerable point we were just really at the top of the mountain and so we did what any sensible mountaineers do we, we dug ourselves in we we we, we, we well we we couldn't build a snow hole as such, but we did manage to carve a ledge mm -hmm. out of the ice right on the summit of the mountain, right on the knife edge crest, crest wow. mountain. So you, you imagine being on a, a thing the size of a small kitchen table <laughs> um, that's made of ice. Wow. Uh, with a thousand meter drop down one side and a 500 meter drop down the other side. Um, wow. So really, really precipitous, precarious position. But it was the only place we could actually stop to get into our sleeping bags and try and sit out this storm. Um, but this storm, well, to cut a very long story short, um, it ended up proving very vicious, really quite um, severe, and also very long lived. And mm. in the end, we ended up trapped on the mountain summit. Um, or a shocking ordeal that was to last for five days and five nights. Five just, days and five nights. Just pinned to the spot. You know, we couldn't even move around. We were literally lying down side by side, trying to stay warm. Um, 
utterly immobile. Um, there was no chance of making a descent in those conditions. Our, our only hope was for the storm to pass over. Um, and as the days wore on, we, you know, we, we, we reckoned that a, a rescue was our best hope. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the rescue helicopters were, were being thwarted by the same storm that was, uh, was giving us so much trouble. And so, in the end, we both, despite heroic efforts to survive, we both began to succumb to hypothermia. Yeah. It was during the fifth night that, um, well, we lost that battle, and um, Jamie Fisher um, sadly perished from wow. hypothermia. And I was probably had an hour or two left before I gave up myself. Wow. But somehow I made it through that final night. And um, first thing the next morning, the rescue helicopters managed to pull me off the mountain in one of the most spectacular and daring rescues in the history of the Alps. They managed to get me down and, and wow. I was literally saved at the 11th hour. Wow. But I did pay a pretty heavy cost because um, by the time I was rescued, my hands and feet were so badly frostbitten, um, literally frozen solid, in fact. Um, wow. They told me later I'd been enduring minus 30 degrees C. Oh, um, wow. So, I don't know. Sorry, I can't in my head convert that into Fahrenheit, but it, it's, um, you know, 30 degrees of frost. Does uh, does not do a great deal of um, good for your your tissue your your, your body. No, I think around um, minus twenty eight they cross or something. So <laughs> not uh, far then, off yeah, from so, the same temperature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, my hands and feet had to be amputated. Wow. No hands. Um, I can't show you my feet, but uh, <laughs> I, I lost my. Um, my hands and feet and I, when I woke up from those operations and I, I looked down my hospital bed and saw that where my hands and feet had previously been were now only neatly bandaged stumps. Wow. Oh well, you know you, you, it's hard to even begin to describe how how shocking that is you know to, to know that you're facing the rest of your life without hands and feet and you know I I, I have to admit there were many times during those first few days and weeks when I truly felt, well, what was the point? I would have been better off just dying up there on the mountain rather wow. than coming down to face a life like this. So that was the big challenge that I faced. Wow. Um, and, you know, on many occasions I, I did nearly give up or I wanted to give up um, but there were some things that really helped to get me through um, mm -hmm. this time. Um, firstly I spent a lot of time thinking about my friend Jamie who died up there on the mountain alongside me you know and, mm -hmm. um, he was in so many ways stronger and more passionate than me I, I couldn't understand how I'd survived and he hadn't. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there was all these emotions you go through, the anger, the guilt, and it was actually those emotions that helped me to come to terms with what had happened, because it was through thinking about Jamie and eventually talking about him that I came to realize, that actually, you know, I was a lucky one. Yeah. I survived. I'd been given a second chance. Jamie, who had so tragically died up there on the mountain, hadn't been so lucky, hadn't been as fortunate as me and hadn't been given that second chance. And, and so I came to make up my mind that I really owed it to him as much as I owed it to everyone who'd fought so hard to save me, mm. as much as I owed it to myself to make the most of this second chance, just to, to give it a go and, and <laughs> find out what was possible without hands and feet. And I'd also like to mention the one other really powerful thing that, that, that helped me through those dark times, and I know it sounds very obvious, but was, was the people around me. And you know, mm. that wasn't obvious to me at the time. I, I really felt that I was suffering this on my own. 
Yeah. I came to realize actually any moment there were dozens, if not hundreds of people who were there that could and wanted to help me. You know, all the professional staff, the doctors, surgeons, nurses, there was um, my friends and family and my girlfriend, Anna, mm-hmm. um, who were around my bedside and, and who cared about me and loved me. And that gave me a great deal of strength to, to face this, this challenge that I faced. So that was it. That was, that was sort of ground zero, if you like. That was my, wow. new, my new beginning. So it was a long journey, um, and I'm not going to, in any way, I'm, I'm not going to try and you know, <laughs> tell you everything about it. Um, it was a case of learning to rebuild my life all over again, one step at a time, mm-hmm. you know, from scratch. Um, because obviously, I, at this stage, without hands and feet, I could do nothing for myself whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I got an, an awful lot of strength from all the people around me, all the support and help that they were able to give me, all the different skills that different people brought. That's what really surprised me was how a lot of people I took for granted or maybe dismissed as being of no interest to me, mm-hmm. turned out to have something very special to give. Everybody had something different. You know, wow. whether it was a professional skill, um, like therapy, mm-hmm. or, 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 or whether it was, was some strong social skill, like, like being able to listen, being able mm-hmm. to understand. Um, and I also quickly discovered the incredible power of, of, of very simple goal setting. Wow. So if you can imagine, lying in hospital, being able to do nothing for yourself whatsoever. Well, then every single achievement becomes this massive victory, you know, even yeah. just being able to pick up the glass of water and suck through the straw mm-hmm. or, um, or, or op- somehow operate the remote on the TV um, in the corner of the room. Those were all little bits of self-esteem won back. That, those were all um, a step further down my road to rehabilitation and independence. And so I just built on those things, those simple things of working with the skills of all the people around me, making the most of what I had, making the most of my new body, um, working one step at a time from goal to goal to goal. Um, and to my surprise, I was able to start, start from nothing and, and relatively quickly rebuild my life wow. so much so that within four months of the accident four months of leaving of losing my hands and feet I was able to actually walk out of the hospital wow leave that behind and move back home and wow. live a relatively independent normal life now don't get me wrong that wasn't the end of the journey there by any means. That was still really just the beginning, but um, it was such a strong start. Um, and I still depended very heavily on Anna, my wife, um, as she became. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so many other people. But I, I, I realized at that point that this wasn't, as I said, the end of my journey, but that, that, um, that I really wanted to carry on um, challenging myself and, and, and doing new things and, and um, getting back into, into all the things I love doing in the world. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I couldn't help myself from turning my eyes once more to the, the hills and the mountains that I loved so much. Good. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I, had these fantastic prosthetic legs that the um, British NHS provide for me. And I was able to, within um, um, what, five months, I was walking in the Scottish hills again. Oh. And 
within a year, I was climbing in the mountains again. Wow. So, yeah, and I, um, each of these activities, I would just take the attitude that whatever it was my friends were doing, I would just go along with them and, and give it a go and, and find out what was possible without hands and feet. So, you know, I, I also um, took up skiing, snowboarding, um, running. So I ran the London Marathon in, in 2001, I think it was. Wow. And eventually I did an Ironman triathlon. So running, cycling and swimming. Wow. Order, actually. Um, and, and what's more, these things all generated an awful lot of interest from the press and the media. And at first, I hated that. That, that felt like a terrible intrusion. Mm -hmm. But eventually, you know, as I was coming to realize, well, there's positive in everything, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a, a use for, for everything in life. So, so why not turn that to some good? So I, I, I just um, used that press attention to raise money for good causes. So you know, I quickly discovered that if I go and, you know, run a marathon, people were, people were inspired by that. People were motivated by that. And it would, it would um, you know, so we were able to, to get a lot, you know, inspire people and, and also raise a lot of money for, for, for charities, for amputees in Africa. Wow. Um, kids who don't have the benefit of the same kind of health care that I have. So, you know, I've always used my situation to try and generate something, something positive. So, yeah, the, the, the story carried on and, and, and does carry on, you know. Um, as I said, I got married to, to, to my, my, my girlfriend at the time, Anna, mm -hmm. um, and we've been married for 20 years now. Wow, congratulations. That's a good milestone, too. <laughs> but the, really the biggest challenge that I faced out of all of it, I haven't even mentioned um and that challenge or, or those challenges they are sitting in the room behind me they are my kids your kids um, <laughs> um, they are i've got three kids iris alex and liam who are 16 and twins of 14. wow and you know they they are a hell of a big challenge climbing mountains without hands and feet turns out to be easy <laughs> it's to easier be than children <laughs> Just three normal healthy kids, um, but you know, um, really the important point is that that life goes on. You know, and if I had died up there on the mountain, well, those three guys would never have even got the chance to go on and experience this incredible gift yeah. that we all have called life. So. To me now, it doesn't really matter so much what I can and can't do. It, it doesn't matter. You know, I, don't, I don't care about what disability I have. I just feel privileged to have even had the opportunity to pass the mantle on to the next generation. I think really what that says to me that it's important to keep things in perspective, you know, to remember what it is you're doing it all for in the first place. And I think, you know, we always get very caught up in, in the the hows and the whys um, of, of, of all the challenges that we face. But sometimes we forget to ask ourselves, well, what are we doing it for in the first place? What is the inspiration that, that, that drives you to get up in the morning, to go to work or to, to sit down at your desk and, and, and push yourself and come up with something creative? What is that driver? What is that inspiration? And, and I think if we can answer that question in our own minds, I think it can really help us to stay motivated and to stay, um, stay positive. Um, mm -hmm. And that inspiration for me will always be my family. So, wow. so there we go. Yeah, that that in a nutshell. And, I, and I've, I've told you the story quite quickly because I, I wanted to give you you more of a chance to kind of yeah, drive drive into anything that any aspect of it 
that you were interested in. But but but, but uh, in a nutshell, that's that's my story. What I find so amazing is you know your spirit not to give up on the things that you love. You know you loved climbing mountains, you loved being athletic, so you weren't going to say, "Well, I don't have any hands and feet now, so I can't do that." You are more active and do more physically challenging things than most people who <laughs> would say, oh, I'm in perfect health. I have nothing wrong with me. Or, you know, people find excuse, oh, I got a bad knee. I have, you know, my hip yeah. hurts sometimes. I can't, I can't go do those sorts of things. And, yeah. and you're like, I have no hands and feet. What's your excuse? <laughs> really? I mean, it, it, just... right, it, it is very easy to find excuses not to do things. Mm -hmm. And I think we do need that metaphorical kick up the backside. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that can come from other places, that can come from other people, but there's no reason why you can't give yourself the own, your own, give yourself your own kick up the backside and remind yourself that, you know, you're just lucky to be here even, you know, to have this incredible gift of life. Mm -hmm. um, and sure, not everything's, poss not, not everything's perfect and other people might seem to have better situation than you but actually you can only deal you can only play the hand that you've been dealt with in life and you know every hand is a winning hand if you play it play it well so um why not just give it a go whatever that whatever that challenge that you've been meaning to get around to doing um is you know get off get off the chair and give it a go you know there's there's no harm no shame in trying something and failing and i keep telling myself that but in actual fact i find that if you do give it a go you re very rarely actually completely fail mm -hmm. you might not get quite the destination that you were expecting in the first place but um success takes very many different forms and uh it's certainly um easier to to attain than than people often think i love how you said every hand is a winning hand if you play it right yeah i mean i'm not a great poker player um but I, um you know that that's what i understand from from games like like poker is it's not about what you've been dealt because you know that's luck that's chance mm -hmm. and great poker players are great at playing that game because they know that they can make the most of everything that they've been given um, and, and life is, is just the same. Wow, that's, that's just so profound. I mean, your story I love so much because you had every, if you, if you were looking for the excuse bucket, you, it, yours was full. <laughs> she took the excuse bucket and, and dumped it out and said, no, you know, I don't need this bucket. And yeah, I think I understood right. Somehow I understood right from the beginning. that If I, if I used that, that pity card, if I played that pity card even once ever. I was done, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it was never going to be okay to To feel sorry for myself because well you've just got to pick yourself up and make the most of, of of what you have in life and and if you're moping feeling sorry for yourself um then then you're absolutely 100 percent sure nothing nothing good is going to happen um, but, but go out and give it a go and you, you just might surprise yourself. I think that's something that needs to be <laughs> shouted from the rooftops everywhere. Yeah. That, you know, playing the pity card and feeling sorry for yourself is never going to get you anywhere good, ever. No matter your yeah. circumstances, no matter if you have every reason to say, I ha deserve the pity card because of this long list of stuff, it's still never going to get you anywhere good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning, though, it's worth appreciating that 
failure when it happens is hard dealing mm -hmm. with setbacks is hard yeah um and you've got to treat those failures like you would treat any grief you know it's a cycle that you go through mm -hmm. you, you go through all these emotions of of anger and denial um but that leads then to a questioning you know well what did i do wrong what can i learn from this how can i turn this experience round into something more positive and how can i then draw a line and 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 move forward and you know that's obviously what i've been able to do with my my you know my life changing accident but mm -hmm. it's exactly what i do every day every 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 time i have a a failure or a setback um i've learned to maybe allow myself a minute or two to <laughs> feel upset to feel anger uh -huh. because those are important emotions but not to let that come to a point where you where, where you're delving into self-pity at mm. that point you need to draw a line and and learn and and, and move forward um so and, and i tell myself well failures are, are good mm -hmm. because um because they're easier to deal with than successes sometimes oh that's um, true you have a dream you know you have a, a massive um life goal and you achieve that great mm -hmm. but then what happens next yeah um, you know that that goal is gone and yeah and it leaves a space leaves it can leave a hole that's hard to fill um whereas if you have a failure well then great you just carry on as you were before you start um regroup and try again you know you don't have to um grieve for the loss of the goal because you still have that dream mm -hmm. um, so i always think of a failure as an opportunity to to hold on to a dream for a little bit longer oh that's a good way to think of it yeah really good wow so much insight i love that thank you yeah that's i bet your kids are amazing <laughs> they no, have no, you as a dad are. and, and you're like, they, yeah i'm they sure they are wonderful but i have to say they are very ordinary um kids and and what surprises me is that they're not miniature versions of myself or my wife you know they almost from the outset they've they've been carving their own paths in life so you know i, I always get asked are, they, are your kids into mountaineering too mm -hmm. and, and no they're not they're into <laughs> art and drama and music and all sorts of other things that, that i have no um um strong um strength in so it's uh it it's interesting and fascinating and I, I think that all i can do as a as a parent as a father is to be there for them and to instill in them a sense that whatever it is they want to achieve, achieve in life you know whatever their hopes and dreams are um if they can only learn to set their mind to it to mm. make the most of the things that they have to make the most of all the opportunities, all the things, all the people around them that they have. And if they can learn to believe in themselves, well, then they can achieve those dreams, whatever they might be. Yeah. So that's my, my goal as a dad is to, uh, to encourage them to be the best version of themselves that they can be. Um, but I'm, I'm not trying to dictate in any way what direction they take because they can well, they will. They are finding those directions for themselves. Mm, that's fantastic. And that's great parenting insight, too. Yeah, Thank but don't you. get me wrong. It doesn't work all the time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just as much uh, struggle struggle with, uh, with parenting as anybody else, believe mm. me. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, Jamie. You've really shared so many inspiring things and great just seeds of wisdom that that people need to hear thank you well it's been a real pleasure you know i i am um, 
I love telling my story because it's still so surprising to me, you know, and, and uh, that this has happened, you know, this is, this is my life. <laughs> and uh, talking about it from the outset was my therapy. Uh -huh. um, and, and so I'm still doing it to this day, 21 years on. And, and if people can take something from that story, if they can learn from it or take some inspiration, then to me, that's uh, an absolute bonus. So I'm very happy to speak to you and um, with you. And uh, yeah, I hope that, um, that, that the whole summit is a fantastic success. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you.